In the dark underbelly of Mafreesboro, Tennessee, the town was forever scarred by the mysterious murder of Laura Salmon. On May 31, 1984, the young life of Laura was tragically cut short, setting off a chain of events that would cast a long shadow over the years to come. The serene streets of Mafreesboro transformed into a haunting battlefield where trust dissolved into suspicion and reality morphed into a chilling nightmare. Laura Salmon's absence created a void that swallowed the innocence of the town, leaving a relentless pursuit of justice in its wake. Against the backdrop of corn and cotton, the story unfolded, a tale of love twisted into violence where innocence met a tragic fate. Through the unyielding determination of two detectives, the truth would gradually emerge from the shadows, unveiling the threads of deception and betrayal. Welcome to the Detective Verse, where we travel into the universe of solved and unsolved crimes and mysteries from all corners of the galaxy. In today's video, we will peel back the layers of this bone chilling mystery. Join us as we piece together the harrowing events surrounding Laura Salmon's disappearance, where her body was found, and the missing clues that were missed in the initial investigation that could have changed everything. Without further ado, let's dive into the case. Step into the quiet streets of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, a town nestled just southeast of the vibrant capital of Nashville. In this unassuming agricultural community, where corn, cotton, and tobacco fields stretch to the horizon, a story unfolds that echoes with both innocence and mystery. Born on the autumn day of October 6, 1965, Laura Lee Salmon embodied the spirit of the girl next door her life woven into the fabric of this tight-knit town. Attending Middle Tennessee State University, Laura balanced her studies with a job as a cashier in the local Kroger grocery store. Her path was familiar, her aspirations ordinary, yet she carried a remarkable charm that earned her the title of Little Miss Murfreesboro during her preschool years. Laura shone brightly throughout her high school years, leaving a trail of fond memories. The fall of 1983 brought a new chapter as Laura started her college journey, while her boyfriend, David Kyle Gilly, pursued his final year at Oakland High School. But the story takes an unexpected turn as the calendar flips to May 31st. Laura's ordinary routine takes an eerie twist when she goes missing after her shift at Kroger, failing to attend a crucial meeting at MTSU and leaving unanswered questions hanging in the air. On May 31, 1984, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, held its breath as the quietude of its fields was disrupted by a grim discovery. Farmer Johnny Muckle's visit to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office unraveled a mystery that would leave the community unsettled. Amid the cotton and corn, the lifeless body of a young woman lay, concealed by an unusual assortment of clothing, jeans, and a jacket wrapped in a tragic narrative. Deputy Chief Robert Asbury, led the investigation, piecing together the fragments of a story that unfolded near a rock quarry, a place where laughter once echoed. Dr. Charles Harlan's examination unveiled the brutality of her end, a series of blows that fractured her skull, a testament to the violence that had unfolded. Amid the facts, question lingered, the absence of sexual assault and the presence of evidence that didn't align. Murfreesboro, a town of innocence, found itself entangled in a tale of shadows. A significant breakthrough came from Robert Lehew, a sergeant in the sheriff's office. He was on the night shift and had an idea that paid off. He knew Laura worked at Kroger's, so he looked around and found her car, a 1976 Oldsmobile Cutlass Salon. Surprisingly, no fingerprints, not even Laura's, were inside the car. Instead, there was a mysterious hair and dirt in the wheel wells. These odd findings turned out to be crucial. Investigators Aubrey Shaw from the TBI and Ronald Rawalt from the FBI looked into these small clues. The dirt wasn't just dirt. It linked Laura's car to the roads near where the crime happened. Through careful examination under a microscope, they uncovered this connection. After Laura's tragic end, her mother, Lorene McKay, bravely pointed at Kyle, Laura's boyfriend, as the culprit. She shared a troubling story of Laura's relationship with him, marked by possessiveness and jealousy. 
Oakland High School had talked about Kyle's controlling ways, and it seemed these rumors were true. Laura's home was a safe space where Kyle was not welcome due to his behavior. What exactly went on in the relationship was unclear, but it was clear that it was tough. Both Ms. McKay and others urged Laura to get a restraining order against Kyle. Continuing their investigation, the detectives turned their attention to Laura's father, Mr. Salmon, and Laura's stepmother, Brenda. Brenda recounted the last time she had seen Laura on the morning of May 31, 1984. Laura and her friend Trina were sleeping in the den, having returned late from an evening out. Mr. Salmon's memory aligned with Brenda's. Both of them bid farewell to Laura that morning, unaware it would be their final goodbye. Their world would shatter that evening when the district attorney arrived to share the tragic news. Laura and Trina, childhood friends and co-workers at Kroger's grocery store, shared a bond that went beyond the aisles. Trina's account revealed that on the night of May 30th, Laura had picked her up at 11 p.m. and the two had ventured to a Nashville nightclub, returning at 3 a.m. The next day, they headed back to work with Laura's shift starting at 9 a.m. Trina's account confirmed Laura's presence at the store until 1 p.m. and the puzzle pieces fell into place when Trina spotted Laura's car in a different spot at 3.30 p.m. Trina's testimony painted a picture of Laura's struggles. Fear clung to her like a shadow, especially when it came to Kyle Gilly. While Laura had been exploring new connections at Middle Tennessee State University, the thought of Kyle discovering this terrified her. The relationship was toxic, and she yearned to escape its grip, though the specter of his reaction held her back. Another Kroger employee joined the narrative, shedding light on Laura's final moments. They recalled leaving work together on May 31st, Laura having changed into Sergio Valente jeans, a top, and brown shoes. Laura confided that she was headed to her grandmother's for a swim. A chilling detail emerged. The employee had seen Laura's bruises on several occasions, a painful testament to the abuse she endured. Aware of Laura's involvement with Kyle, she urged Laura to confide in someone, emphasizing that physical harm had no place in a relationship. As the investigators wove through the threads of Laura's life, a portrait emerged of a young woman caught in the clutches of fear, struggling against the chains of an abusive relationship. On the evening of May 31st, a pivotal phone call reached the Salmon household, Kyle Gilley's voice on the other end. This call came shortly after the news of Laura's murder had reached them, Mr. Salmon urged Kyle to visit the sheriff's office, where he answered questions posed by Detective Asbury. In his informal statement, Kyle recounted seeing Laura at her grandmother's place from 6.30 p.m. to around 10.30 p.m. on May 30th. Plans were set for a swim the following afternoon, but Laura seemed to vanish. Formal proceedings commenced on June 6th when Kyle returned for a structured interview and his Miranda rights were read aloud. Present for this conversation was Kyle's stepfather. The story shifted slightly, according to Kyle. He and Laura left her grandmother's apartment at 9 p.m., parking behind the Bellwood Church for a shared intimate moment. They returned to Laura's grandmother's afterwards, leaving separately around 10.30 p.m. Kyle's night led him to work and eventually to sleep, while he assumed Laura headed back to her father's home. Kyle's stepfather supported this account, noting that when he arrived home at 3 p.m., Kyle was still asleep. He briefly left to search for Laura and returned around 5.30 p.m. A subsequent interview conducted in early July 1984 by Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, Agent Tom Carmouche delved further into the narrative. Kyle expanded on his story, adding that after their encounter, they cleaned up using a pair of jeans he had in the car. He disclosed that he slept until 4.40 p.m. after work only learning about Laura's murder upon his visit to the sheriff's office. However, Agent Carmouche probed, suggesting that Kyle couldn't have been certain that Laura had gone straight home after leaving her grandmother's. Kyle's response was swift and agitated, jumping from his chair to insist that she wouldn't do that. His certainty clashed with the emerging truth. It was evident she hadn't gone home. Instead, Laura had picked up her friend Trina after her shift, and the two ventured into Nashville for a night of clubbing. As the investigation continued, the pieces of Laura's last moments gradually came together, painting a portrait of a young life cut short and the search for elusive answers. 
as detectives meticulously pieced together a timeline, an unexpected figure entered the scene. A woman from Nashville reached out to the police, reporting a harrowing incident of sexual assault. Her assailant chillingly referenced Laura's murder, threatening to replicate the same fate. The path led detectives to a startling revelation. The woman's attacker was connected to Middle Tennessee State University, attended the same gym, and frequented the same fraternity parties as Laura. He also had been near the campus on the day of Laura's murder. Patty Choatra, a forensic chemist from the FBI, entered the fray, examining the hair found in Laura's car in comparison to the new suspect. Although DNA testing was still years away, the lab could assert that the hair's characteristics aligned with the new lead. However, a single strand wasn't sufficient for charges to be pressed, leaving investigators hungry for more concrete evidence. Attention turned to the men's jeans discovered at the crime scene, waist size 30 inches, inseam 36 inches. Unfortunately, this lead ran dry as these dimensions didn't match the new suspect. With a list of nearly 100 potential culprits, no one seemed to fit the puzzle perfectly. Complicating matters were missteps during the investigation, causing unease for Laura's family. An unsettling incident arose when Laura's father visited the crime scene after its release by the police, only to find her necklace and blood-stained rocks. He collected these items and handed them over to the authorities. Later, it was revealed that the crime scene had not been properly secured overnight after Laura's body was discovered. Detectives had also neglected to wear gloves while gathering evidence. Additionally, a formal statement from the person who found Laura's body was never taken. Despite these shortcomings, Laura's case remained open. Over the years, new sets of eyes revisited the file in the hopes of finally identifying a suspect. The shadows of uncertainty lingered as Laura's story continued to unfold, each chapter marked by determination, frustration, and a steadfast pursuit of justice. It took 16 long years for Laura's case to finally find its resolution. In the year 2000, a pair of determined cold case detectives, Bill Sharp and Dan Goodwin, embarked on the daunting task of seeking out Laura's killer under the banner of the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office. Goodwin felt a deep personal connection to Laura's story. They were both part of the MTSU community. Laura was a little sister in Goodwin's fraternity, and they had even shared a trip to the movies merely four days before her tragic end. At her funeral, Goodwin promised Laura's grieving mother that he would tirelessly pursue justice. With an unconventional journey into law enforcement, transitioning from journalism to policing, he found himself back on the case that had touched him deeply. Their first steps included reevaluating the evidence that had been collected over the years. The advancement of technology now offered a chance to uncover new leads. The evidence was sent to the TBI lab for updated testing, particularly focusing on identifying the source of the semen found on the pair of rustler jeans. Meanwhile, they delved into the troves of old interviews and case files, hoping to unearth any overlooked leads. In the year 2000, a new lead emerged. A student from Oakland High School claimed that his own father was responsible for Laura's death. This potential suspect had a criminal record for aggravated assault, but when detectives pursued this avenue, they found that he had already passed away. However, they obtained DNA samples from his children, which ultimately did not match the DNA evidence from Laura's crime scene. Even Goodwin himself provided his DNA, given his prior connection to Laura, but it too yielded no matches. One name that continued to linger on the suspect list, even after 16 years, was Kyle Gilly. During a meticulous interview of Laura's case file, detectives discovered a note that challenged Kyle's alibi. The note indicated that a female witness had seen Kyle in Laura's car, driving it near the road to the quarry around 3.25 p.m. on May 31st, a contradiction to his claim of being home at that time. Amidst the passage of time and the twists and turns of the investigation, Laura's memory lived on through the dedication of these detectives. As the threads of the case began to weave together, the hope for closure grew stronger, promising answers to the questions that had haunted the town of Murfreesboro for so long. Detectives managed to locate Gladys M., who had been employed at the Heatcraft Division of Lennox Industries during the time of Laura's murder. She recounted her memories to the detectives, revealing that on the afternoon of May 31, 1984, 
as she was driving home from work, she encountered an intriguing sight. A two-toned beige Oldsmobile Cutlass with tinted windows sat at the intersection of Twin Oak and Halls Pike, the very road leading away from the quarry. The car didn't move, and after a while, she proceeded through the intersection. It was only the next day, upon learning about the murder, that she confided in co-workers about the unusual car she had seen at the intersection. Gladys became a key player in the unfolding narrative when presented with a photo array. From this array, she identified Kyle as the person behind the wheel of the car she had seen. She recollected that he possessed a slender frame, dark shoulder-length hair, and seemed tall based on the position of the front seat. In her memory, what stood out was the driver's blank expression as he stared straight ahead. Gladys's connection to the case deepened through her interactions with law enforcement. She had contacted the sheriff's office after seeing Kyle's photo in the newspaper and participated in an interview with TBI agent Carmouche a few months later, reiterating her identification of Kyle from a lineup. As Detective Sharp and Goodwin delved into the archives, old witnesses were revisited and new ones emerged. A clearer picture began to emerge, and it was a violent one. Kim B., a friend and neighbor of Laura's, was one of those witnesses. She recounted an incident from the police station, where both she and Kyle were questioned simultaneously. Afterward, Kyle offered her a ride home, during which he expressed a desire to visit Laura's father's house. While at the Salmon residence, Kim witnessed Kyle rifling through Laura's belongings and taking some of her letters, a scene that cast a shadow of suspicion. Following a perplexing series of events, Kim and Kyle found themselves at a party, an atmosphere that took a disturbing turn when Kyle made inappropriate advances towards Kim. He uttered unsettling words, Laura's dead, she won't know, hinting at a chilling disregard for his former girlfriend's life. Uncomfortable, Kim left the party with Kyle, engaging in a conversation in a parking lot. In this exchange, Kyle repeatedly questioned why Laura had supposedly cheated on him and what she had done to him. Disturbed by his demeanor, Kim sought refuge by seeking another ride home, deeply unsettled by the encounter. Another missing piece was discovered in Shelley D., a witness never questioned during the initial investigation. Shelley, a high school sophomore in 1984, had crossed paths with Kyle at a keg party, and the two had ventured to the rock quarry on Twin Oak Drive. During their interaction, Kyle broached a chilling topic, asking Shelley if she wanted to end up like Laura Salmon. When Shelley inquired about Laura, Kyle shockingly revealed, she was my ex-girlfriend, and I killed her. It wasn't until June 2000 that Shelley decided to come forward, providing crucial testimony that had remained hidden for years. Meanwhile, the TBI lab was hard at work, re-examining the evidence surrounding the rustler genes. Crime scene technicians discovered bloodstains above the knees, indicating that the person wearing the jeans had knelt over Laura during the attack. The blood spatter pattern suggested a medium velocity, implying that an instrument, such as a rock, had been utilized, lacking substantial force. Crucially, the blood spatter on the jeans matched Laura's blood. Among the evidence, a small semen sample was also found on the rustler jeans. The focus now shifted towards identifying the owner of this sample, Kyle Gilly. Kyle had relocated to Brandonton, Florida in 1986, where he worked for the Public Works Department in Manatee County. Assisting in the case, Rich Gherkin, a sergeant from the Manatee County Sheriff's Office, questioned Kyle in May 2000. Kyle denied knowledge of the rock quarry before Laura's murder, any jealousy, physical violence with Laura, or sexual activity with her prior to her death. A blood sample was eventually taken from Kyle under a warrant and sent to the TBI lab in Tennessee for DNA testing. The culmination of years of persistence was drawing closer as the truth inched towards the surface, ready to shine a light on a case that had long remained enshrouded in darkness. On May 31st, 2000, a significant milestone was reached. The DNA sample extracted from Kyle Gilly was finally matched against the semen sample discovered on the rustler jeans. On the 16th anniversary of Laura's tragic murder, the results revealed a damning connection. Kyle Gilly was indeed the source of the sample, strongly suggesting that he had been wearing those very jeans when he fatally assaulted Laura 
kneeling over her and wielding rocks as weapons. Detective Goodwin's commitment was unyielding, and he returned to Florida on November 13, 2001, for another pivotal interview with Kyle Gilley. Following this interview, Kyle signed a statement asserting that his relationship with Laura had been primarily sexual, and neither of them felt jealousy as they both saw other people. He adamantly denied being violent towards Laura or any other women, although he did acknowledge an incident where she had chipped her tooth while playfully jumping on him. Kyle refuted ever visiting Laura at her MTSU dorm, heading to the rock quarry, or going to the Salmon residence on the night of her murder. He did concede that the rustler jeans were likely his, leaving the door slightly ajar for the impending confrontation. Detective Goodwin managed to extract Kyle's denials, some of which he knew contradicted the evidence. Goodwin had vivid recollections of seeing Kyle with Laura on the MTSU campus and was aware of Kyle's statement in 1984 that he had visited the rock quarry on two occasions. Armed with this knowledge, Goodwin informed Kyle that an expert witness would testify that the killer had worn those rustler jeans during the murder. Kyle's response was to request an attorney. On November 14, 2001, the wheels of justice turned decisively as David Kyle Gilley was apprehended in Brandonton, Florida and charged with first-degree murder. His trial unfolded in September 2006, with his defense attempting to undermine the prosecution's case by pointing to unknown DNA found at the crime scene, suggesting his innocence. However, the evidence presented against him proved convincing and the jury found him guilty of murder. He was subsequently sentenced to life in prison. As the story of Laura Salmon unfolds, questions linger in the air like echoes of the past. What drove Kyle Gilley to take a life? Could the secrets concealed in those fields have prevented this tragedy? Let us know your thoughts down below.